Theorites, Tales of One Thousand and One Nights Volume 2 By Anonymous Author Audiobook 64x70 My Lady, if I did not wish to, not wish to spare your feelings, I would describe some of the sufferings that you have inflicted on me and I would excuse myself, although it was you who injured me and it was you who wronged both yourself and me. You clearly broke your word and were unfaithful in preferring someone else to me and rejecting my love. That was your choice and I can only ask for God's help. She showed me the rare gifts he had sent to her, whose value came to 30,000 dinars. When I next saw her, she had married him. Thousand dinars. When I next saw her, she had married him. Al-Rashid said. Had Damra not forestalled me, I would have made an approach to her. Asterisk a story is also told, O king, that Ishak ibn Ibrahim al-Mausili said. I was at home one winter's night when clouds had spread across the sky and rain was pouring down in floods as though from the mouths of water skins. No one was abroad on the streets, coming or going, because of the rain and the mud. I was depressed because none of my friends had come to visit me and it was too muddy for me to go to them. So I told my servant to bring me something to distract me, but although he fetched food and drink, I could not enjoy the meal as there was nobody to keep me company, and I kept on looking out of the windows and watching the roads until night fell. Then I remembered a slave girl who belonged to one of the sons of Al Mahdi with whom I had been in love and who was an accomplished singer and musician. Were she here with me tonight, I said to myself, I would be completely happy and no longer have to spend the time worried and uneasy. Just at that moment there was a knock on the door and a voice called. May a beloved come in who is standing at the door. It may be that the tree of my wishes has borne fruit, I said to myself and when I went to the door I found my mistress wrapped in a green cloak with a covering of brocade on her head to protect her from the rain. She was in a sad state, covered in mud up to her knees, her clothes drenched by water from the gutters. My lady, I exclaimed, what has brought you here through all this mud? She said. When your messenger came to me here through all this mud. She said. When your messenger came to me and told me how full you were of love and longing, there was no help for it but to answer the summons and hurry here to you. I was taken aback by this. Morning now dawned and Shahrazad broke off from what she had been allowed to say. Then, when it was the 696th night, she continued. I have heard, O oh fortunate king, that when the girl came and knocked on the door, Ishak went out and said, my lady, what has brought you here in conditions like these? She replied. When your messenger came to me and told me how full you were of love and longing, there was no help for it but to answer the summons and hurry here to you. Ishak went on. I was taken aback by this, but as I didn't want to tell her that I had not sent anyone, what I said was. Praise be to God who has reunited us after the sufferings that I have had to endure. If you had been any slower in coming, I would have had to go to you because of the extent of my longing and love. On my instructions, my servant now fetched a container filled with hot water to help her tidy herself, and as he poured the water over her feet, I myself took charge of washing them. Then I called for one of the most splendid of my robes, which I gave her to wear after she had taken off her own. We sat down and I called for food, but she refused to eat. I asked if she wanted wine, and when she said yes, I fetched wine cups. Who will sing? she asked, but when I volunteered, she said that she did not want that, nor did she agree when I suggested that one of my slave girls should sing. Sing yourself, then, I said but she refused, and when I asked who was going to do it then, she replied. Go out and find someone to sing for me. I went out obediently but unhopefully, certain that in weather like that I was not going to find anyone. I walked on until I got to the main street, 
and there I caught sight of a blind man tapping on the ground with his stick. He was muttering. May God give no good reward to my hosts. If I sang, they would not listen and, if I stayed silent, they made fun of me. Are you a singer? I inquired, and when he said that he was, I asked. Would you give us the pleasure of your company for the rest of this night? If you want that, then take hold of my hand, he replied, and so I led him by the hand back to my house and said to the girl. My lady, I have brought a singer to entertain us. He is blind and so he will not be able to see us. Bring him to me, she said, and when I had done this I invited him to eat, which he did sparingly and then washed his hands. I then fetched him wine and he drank three glasses before asking me who I was. When I told him that I was Ishak ibn Ibrahim al-Mausili, he said. I have heard of you and I am pleased to be drinking with you now. I am glad that you are pleased, I told him, and he then asked me to sing for him. As a joke I took the lute and said. To hear is to obey. When I had finished the song, he told me. Ishak, you are not far from being a singer. This was a blow to my self-esteem and so I threw the lute away. Do you have no one here who can sing well? he asked. When I told him that I had a girl with me, he said. Tell her to sing, and I asked. Will you sing yourself when you have satisfied yourself about her performance? Yes, he replied, but when she had sung, he said. She has no skill, and she threw away the lute in anger saying. I have done my best and if there is anything you can do, then produce it for us. Fetch me a lute that has not been touched by any hand, the blind man said, and on my orders my servant produced a new one. After fingering it, he struck up a strain that I did not recognize and then set about singing these lines. Through the gloom of a dark night there came a devoted lover, knowing the times of rendezvous. What roused me was a greeting and the words. May a loved one enter, who is standing by the door. The girl looked at me askance and said. Could you not keep our secret for a single hour before entrusting it to this man? I swore that I had not told him anything and excused myself to her before starting to kiss her hands, tickle her breasts and bite her cheeks until she laughed. Then I turned to the blind man and asked him to sing again. He took the lute and sang these lines. How often have I visited lovely girls? touching their dyed fingers with my hands, tickling the pomegranate breasts and nibbling at the ruddy apple cheeks. Who told him what we were doing? I asked her. That's right, she said, and we moved away from him. He then said that he needed to relieve himself and so I told my servant to take a candle and go ahead of him. He went out, and then, as he was taking a long time, we went to look for him, but without success. The doors were locked and the keys were in their cupboard, leaving us to wonder whether he had been snatched up into the sky or had sunk into the earth. I then realized that this was Ibli, who had played the pimp for me, and I remembered the lines of Abu Nuwas. I wondered at Ibli in his pride and evil intent, he was too haughty to prostrate himself to Adam, but then became a pimp for Adam's seed. Shahrazad continued. A story is also told that Ibrahim ibn Ishak said. I was a particular friend of the Barmecides. One day, while I was at home, a knock came at my door and my servant went out and then came back to tell me that a handsome youth was asking leave to enter. I gave permission and in came a young man who was showing signs of illness. I have been trying to meet you for a long time, he said, as there is something that I need from you. When I asked him what that was, he brought out three hundred dinars, set them before me and said. Please accept these and, in exchange, let me have an air to which to set verses that I shall recite. I told him to produce the verses. Morning now dawned and Shahrazad broke off from what she had been allowed to say. Then, when it was the six hundred and ninety-seventh night, 
she continued. I have heard, O fortunate king, that when the young man came to Ishak, he set three hundred dinars before him and said. Please accept these and, in exchange, let me have an heir to which I can set verses that I shall recite. Ibrahim went on. I told him to produce the verses and he recited. By God, my eye has wronged my heart, let it quench the grief of love with tears. Time is among those who blame me for my love. But, wrapped within my shroud, I shall not see her face. I composed an air for him like a lament and sang it, after which he fainted until I thought that he was dead. When he recovered he asked me to sing it again, but I said. God forbid, telling him I was afraid lest it kill him. I wish it would, he said, and he continued to entreat me humbly until I took pity on him and sang it again. This led to an even more violent reaction, but in spite of the fact that I was quite certain that he was dead, I went on sprinkling him with rose water until he recovered and sat up. I thanked God for his recovery before returning him his dinars and saying, Take your money and leave me. I don't need it, he said, and you can have as much again if you sing the air once more. I was attracted by the thought of the money, and I told him that I would do this but only on three conditions, the first being that he should stay and eat with me so as to strengthen himself, the second being that he should harden himself by drinking wine and the third that he should tell me his story. He did as I asked and said. I come from Medina. One day, I went out on an excursion and took the road to Alakik with some companions. It was then that, among a group of girls, I caught sight of one like a branch decked with dewdrops, whose glances slew all those at whom she looked. She and her friends sheltered in the shade until evening and, when they left, I discovered that my heart was suffering from wounds that were slow to heal. When I went back, I tried to find out about the girl, but without any success, and when I attempted to follow up her trail in the markets, no one could tell me anything and I fell sick with grief. I then told my story to a relative of mine, who said that I should not worry, explaining. It's still spring and we can expect rain. Then the girl will go out and I shall come with you, after which you can do what you want. This comforted me and I waited until the water course at Alakik ran full and became a popular spot to visit. I went there with my brothers and some other relatives, and we sat in the same place that I had been before. Before we had been waiting for long, the women came hurrying up like horses running in a race and I asked one of my female relatives to tell the girl. This man says. How well the poet expressed it when he said. She shot an arrow at my heart and turned away, she shot an arrow at my heart and turned away, leaving me with new wounds and scars. When my messenger has gone to her and told her that, she said. Tell him how well this was answered in the lines. I have the same complaint as you. Patience. It may be that our hearts will soon be cured. I said nothing more for fear of a scandal and got up to leave. She rose at the same time and I followed her until she saw that I had discovered where she lived. After that she started to come to me, while I would go to meet her, and this happened so often that it became widely known and word reached her father. I kept on trying to meet her and complained to my father, who collected my relatives and went to her father to ask for her hand in marriage. He said. Had this request come to me before my daughter had been put to open shame, I would have accepted, but as it is now notorious, I'm not going to prove that the gossip was right. Ibrahim continued. I sang the air to him again, and he left after telling me where he lived, and we then became friends. Jafribn Yahya held an assembly, which I attended as usual, and I sang the young man's lines for him to his great delight. He drank some wine and asked me whose lines they were, at which I told him the young man's story. Jafar instructed me to ride over and to assure him that he would get what he wanted, and after I had gone to him, I brought him to Jafar, who asked him to repeat the story. 
He did that and Jafar then delighted him by saying that he would guarantee to marry him to the girl. He stayed there with us, and in the morning Jafar rode to Al-Rashid, who was charmed when he heard the story. He ordered us both to come and told me to sing the air, to which he drank. He then sent a letter to his governor in the Hijaz telling him to make liberal provision for the girl's father and her family and to send them to him with all honor. They were not long in coming and Al-Rashid summoned the father and told him to marry his daughter to the young man. He was then given a hundred thousand dinars and returned to his family. The young man stayed as one of Jafar's boon companions until the fall of the Barmacides, after which he returned with his family to Medina. May Almighty God have mercy on all their souls. A story is also told, O fortunate king, that the vizier Abu Amir ibn Marwan had been given an exceedingly handsome Christian boy. Al-Malik al-Nasir noticed him and asked the boy's master where he had come from. From God was the reply, at which the king exclaimed. Are you trying to terrify me with stars and imprison me with moons? The vizier apologized and took care to prepare a present which he sent to the king along with the boy, to whom he said. You must be part of the present, but had I not been forced to do this I would never have let you go. He wrote these lines. Master, this moon has risen on your horizon, and the horizon is a fitter place for moons than earth. I seek to please you with the gift of this precious soul. Never before have I seen one who sought to please you with his own hearts have I seen one who sought to please you with his own heart's blood. Al-Nasir approved of this and rewarded the vizier with a large quantity of money and an assured position. Some time later, the vizier was presented with one of the loveliest of women as a slave girl. He was afraid that Al-Nasir might hear of this and might ask for her, as had happened in the case of the boy. So he prepared an even more lavish gift and sent it to him with her. Morning now dawned and Shahrazad broke off from what she had been allowed to say. Then, when it was the 698th night, she continued. I have heard, O fortunate king, that when the vizier had been given this slave girl, he was afraid that Al-Nasir might hear of her and the same thing would happen as had done with the boy. So he prepared an even more lavish gift and sent it to him with her. He wrote the following lines. Master, here is the sun, following the moon, sent to you so that sun and moon may meet, a conjunction promising felicity. So enjoy through them the river of paradise. They have no match in beauty, just as you have no match as king of all mankind. As a result he enjoyed even greater favor with Al-Nasir but then his as a result he enjoyed even greater favor with Al-Nasir, but then his enemies spread a report that he still had a passion for the boy and continued to talk about him while under the influence of wine, gnashing his teeth at the thought that he had given him away. So Al-Nasir threatened that if he kept talking about the boy he would cut off his head, and then wrote him a letter, purporting to come from the boy, in which he said, Master, you know that you used to be mine alone and I was always happy with you. Although I am with the king, I would prefer to be alone with you, but I am afraid of his power. Can you think of some way of asking me back from him? Al-Nasir sent this note with a youngster, who was to tell the vizier that it came from the boy and that Al-Nasir himself had not said anything to him. When Abu Amir understood the dangerous deception in this message brought by Al-Nasir's servant, he wrote these lines on the back of the paper. Should a man of experience and discretion do his best to go into the lion's den? I am not a man whose intelligence is overcome by love, nor am I ignorant of what the envious claim. I have willingly presented you with my life, but how can life be brought back once it leaves? When Al-Nasir read this, he was struck with wonder at the intelligence of the vizier and after that he would never listen to anything said by his detractors. Al-Nasir later asked him how he had escaped from the snare that had been laid for him, and the vizier told him. It was because my intelligence was not trapped by love. A story is also told, O fortunate king, 
that in the time of the Caliph Harun al-Rashid there was a man called Ahmad al-Danaf and another called Hassan Shuman, both of whom were wily and resourceful men who had performed remarkable feats. Because of this the Caliph presented them both with robes of honor and appointed them as joint commanders of the city watch, each with a monthly allowance of a thousand dinars and each with forty men under their command. Ahmad was responsible for the district lying outside the city wall. He and Hassan rode out with their men accompanied by the Emir Khalid, the Wali, together with a herald who proclaimed that, in accordance with the orders of the Caliph, Ahmad al-Danaf was to be the sole commander of the right flank company of the city watch of Baghdad while Hassan Shuman was to command the left flank. Their orders were to be obeyed and they were to be treated with respect. In the city there was an old woman known as Delilah the Wily, with the daughter who was known as Zainab the Trickster. When they heard the proclamation, Zainab said to Delilah, Look at this man, Ahmad al-Danaf, mother. He came here when he was thrown out of Cairo and he played his tricks in Baghdad until he ingratiated himself with the Caliph and became commander of the right wing of the watch, while that scabby fellow, Hassan Shuman, commands the left. They are given two meals a day and each of them has a thousand dinars a month, while we sit at home with no jobs, no status, no respect, and no one to ask after us. Delilah's husband had commanded the city watch of Baghdad with a monthly allowance of a thousand dinars from the caliph, but he had died, leaving two daughters. One of these was married, with the son called died, leaving two daughters. One of these was married, with the son called Ahmad al-Lakit, while Zainab the trickster was unmarried. Delilah herself was a mistress of wiles, deception, and subterfuge. She could trick a snake out of its hole and tutor Ibli in double dealing. Her husband had been in charge of the caliph's pigeons, with a monthly salary of a thousand dinars, and it was he who had reared the carrier pigeons which took letters and messages with the result that in emergencies each bird was dearer to the caliph than one of his own sons. Zainab now told her mother to play some trick to win them a reputation in Baghdad and get them the salary that her father had been paid. Morning now dawned and Shahrazad broke off from what she had been allowed to say. Then, when it was the 699th night, she continued. I have heard, O oh fortunate king that Zainab told her mother to play some trick to win them a reputation in Baghdad and get them the salary that her father had been paid. Delilah swore that she would outdo both Ahmad al-Danaf and Hassan Shuman and so, getting up, she veiled her face and clothed herself in wool like a poor woman with a dress that went down to her ankles, a woolen juba and a broad belt. She took a jug which she filled up to its neck with water, and she then put three dinars in its mouth which she covered with a tuft of palm fiber. Around her neck she wore a rosary the size of a load of firewood and in her hand she carried a flag made of red and yellow patches. She went out calling on the name of God, but while her tongue was praising him, her heart was galloping on the racetrack of evil, as she looked out for some trick to play in the city. She went from one lane to another until she came to one that was paved with marble and had been swept and sprinkled with water and there she saw an arched doorway with a marble threshold where a Macribe gatekeeper was standing. The house belonged to the chief of the caliph's officers, a landed proprietor who enjoyed a large income. He was called Hassan Shar al tariq asterisk because his blow came before his word, and he was married to a beautiful girl whom he loved. On their wedding night she had made him swear to take no other wife and to spend no single night away from home. One day, when her husband went to the caliph's court, he noticed that each of the emirs was accompanied by one son or two, and then, when he went into the baths and looked at his face in the mirror, he saw that there were more white than black hairs in his beard. He said to himself, God took away your father and will he not provide you with a son? He was in an angry mood when he went back to his wife and, when she wished him a good evening, he said, Get away from me. From the day that I first saw you nothing has gone right for me. Why is this? she asked, and he said. 
On our wedding night you made me swear to take no other wife. Today I saw that every single emir had one or two sons. I thought about dying without issue, and a man who leaves no heir will not be remembered, and I am angry because you are barren and cannot conceive by me. His wife invoked God's name against him and said. I have worn away mortars by pounding powders and medicines, and the fault is not mine but yours. You are a flat-nosed mule with watery and infertile sperm that cannot inseminate and produce children. I am going on a journey, he told her, and when I come back I shall take another wife. It is God who determines my fortune, she told him. He then left her and each of them was sorry for having blamed the other. Later, as the girl looked out of the window like a fairy princess in all her jewels, Delilah, who was standing outside, saw her in her finery and her rich clothes and said to herself. It would be a true test of cunning to take this girl from her husband's house, strip her of her jewelry and clothes and take the lot. So she stood beneath the window of the house calling repeatedly on the name of God and what the girl saw was an old woman dressed as a Sufi whose white clothes were like a dome of light and who was saying, Come, you saints of God! The women of the quarter looked out of their windows and exclaimed, God has sent us aid! Radiance is spreading from the face of this Sheikha! Katun, the wife of the Amir Hassan, burst into tears and told her slave girl, Go down and kiss the hand of Abu Ali, the gatekeeper, and tell him to let the Sheikha come in so that we may be blessed by her presence. The girl went down and did what she was told, passing on her mistress's message to the gatekeeper. Morning now dawned and Shahrazad broke off from what she had been allowed to say. Then, when it was the seven hundredth night, she continued. I have heard, O oh fortunate king that the girl went down to tell the gatekeeper that her mistress's instructions were that he should let the Sheikha come in to see her so that both she and everyone else there might be blessed by her presence, and he in his turn went to kiss Delilah's hand, but she would not let him and said, Keep away from me lest you spoil my state of purity. But you two are drawn to God and have won the attention of his saints. May he free you from this servile state, Abu Ali. Abu Ali was in difficulties, as he was owed three months' wages which he did not know how to get from the emir. He said, Give me a drink from your jug, mother, so that I may get a blessing from you. She took the jug from her shoulder and twirled it through the air with a flick of her hand so that the fiber covering fell from its mouth and the three dinars dropped on the ground. Abu Ali saw them, picked them up and said to himself, by God, this Sheikha is a lady of power. She discovered my secret, found that I needed spending money and conjured up three dinars for me from the air. He took them in his hand and said, Aunt, take these three dinars which have fallen on the ground from your jug. Keep them away from me, Delilah said, for I am one of those who are unconcerned about worldly things. Take them yourself and use them for your own purposes in place of what you are owed by the Emir. Abu Ali took this as a matter of divine inspiration and heavenly aid. The slave girl now kissed Delilah's hand and took her to her mistress, whom she found, on entering, to be like a treasure freed from talismanic spells. Delilah greeted her, kissed her hand and said, Daughter, it is divine providence that has brought me to you. Katun produced food for her, but she said, I only eat the food of paradise and break my fast on no more than five days in the year. But I can see that you are worried and I want you to tell me why. Mother, replied Katun, on my wedding night I made my husband swear that he would take no other wife. Then he looked at other men's sons and, in his longing for them, he accused me of being barren while I told him that he was an infertile mule. He went off in a fit of anger, promising to take another wife when he came back from his journey. I am afraid that he will divorce me and marry another, as he is a man of property with a large income, and if he has sons by another wife it is they who will take the wealth and the property instead of me. Daughter, said Delilah, 
Don't you know about my master, Abu al Hamalat? If any debtor goes to him as a pilgrim, God will free him of his debt, and any barren woman who visits him will conceive. When Katun told her that since the day of her wedding she had not left her house either to offer condolences or congratulations, Delilah said, I shall take you with me on a visit to Abu al Hamalat. If you cast your burden on him and make a vow to him, it may be that when your husband comes back from his journey and lies with you, you will conceive either a daughter or a son, and the child, of whichever sex it may be, will become a dervish in the service of the Sheikh Abu al Hamalat. Katun got up and put on the most splendid of her clothes as well as all her jewelry, telling her maid to keep an eye on the house. To hear is to obey, my lady, the girl replied and Katun then went down and was met by the gatekeeper, who asked where she was going. When she told him that she was going to visit the Sheikh Abu al-Hamalat, he said, I swear to fast for a year if this Sheikha is not a holy saint. She has mystical powers and she gave me three dinars of red gold, having found out my secrets and knowing that I was in need, without my having to ask her. So Delilah set off with Katun telling her as she went. When you visit the Sheikh Abu al Hamalat, you will find comfort. Through the permission of Almighty God you will conceive and, thanks to the blessing brought by the Sheikh, you will regain your husband's love and never again hear any hurtful words from him. Katun agreed to visit the Sheikh, and Delilah said to herself. Where can I strip her of her clothes while the people are going to and fro? She then told Katun to walk behind her while still keeping her in sight, explaining that she had many burdens which people would lay upon her and that all those who had votive offerings to make would present them to her and kiss her hand. So Katun followed at a distance, with her anklets tinkling and the tassels in her hair sounding, as Delilah led her to the merchant's market. Delilah now passed the booth of a very handsome young merchant, Sayyid Hassan, whose cheeks had not yet sprouted down. When he saw Katun approaching, he started to look at her out of the corner of his eye and, on noticing this, Delilah made a sign to her and told her, Sit by this booth until I come for you. Katun did as she was told, and when she had sat down in front of Hassan's booth he cast her a glance that was followed by a thousand sighs. Delilah then went up to him, greeted him, and asked him if he was Hassan, the son of Musan, the merchant. Yes, he said, but who told you my name? Good people directed me to you, she replied, and added. Know that the girl over there is my daughter. Her father was a merchant who died, leaving her a great deal of money. She is of marriageable age and try to find a husband for your daughter but not a wife for your son is a saying of the wise. This is the first day that she has ever been out, and my inner heart has been prompted to make me marry her to you. If you are poor, I shall provide you with capital and in place of your one shop, I shall open two for you. Hassan said to himself, I asked God to send me a bride and he has granted me three gifts wealth, a woman, and fine clothes. Well spoken, mother, he said to Delilah. My own mother has long been saying that she wanted to find me a wife, but I would never agree, telling her that I would only marry a girl whom I had seen for myself. Get on your feet and follow me, Delilah told him, and I shall let you see her naked. Hassan got up to accompany her taking with him a thousand dinars in case he needed to buy something. Morning now dawned and Shahrazad broke off from what she had been allowed to say. Then, when it was the seven hundred and first night, she continued. I have heard, O oh fortunate king, that Delilah told Hassan. Get up and follow me and I shall let you see naked. Hassan got up to accompany her taking with him a thousand dinars in case he needed to buy something or to pay the fees for the marriage contract. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.